Hi everybody, this is what uh, you need to know from week three. So I'm going to go through this PowerPoint and uh, you'll want to have your document open that has uh, where you list what you've learned and, and what you uh, didn't understand. So first things first, um, last week uh, I wanted you to learn that the Articles of Confederation was a failure, our first government. So uh, they wrote a new constitution. Um, and the, the purpose of the Constitutional Convention was just really to revise the Articles of Confederation, but they went beyond that. The first thing they decided to do was to throw the Articles out and start from scratch. So uh, our, our new Constitution has some connection to the Articles of Confederation, but for the most part, it's a brand new document, okay? So um, the, the important thing about this convention was, um, you know, these people got together and they, they were forming a new government. And the thing they had to decide to do on uh, was how do we make this work? With, with 13 states, uh, you got some big states like Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, uh, Virginia, and you got some small states like New Jersey. How do we make them both feel like they have a stake in this government? So there were several compromises that the states uh, decided to put together. The first one was um, the Great Compromise. Uh, the, the Virginia plan and, I'm sorry, the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan were two of the leading plans for government that they put together and they debated. The, the Virginia plan was to base the legislature on population. So if, you had a, if your state had a bigger population, in another state, you sent more delegates to the legislature. New Jersey, which had a smaller population, said, no way, we don't want that because we're a small state. We'll be outvoted all the time by a big state like Virginia. So um, they came up with something called the Great Compromise. And like a lot of compromises, um, there were people on both sides, and they didn't see the gray area. And the gray area was put together by, pointed out by Connecticut. He said, why don't we take the best of both of those plans? So the first thing uh, Connecticut said was, New Jersey has a great idea, so does Virginia. Why don't we have a two-house legislature? The House of Representatives will be based on population. That will satisfy big states. Uh, and then you have an upper house, the Senate, which is based on equal, representative, equal representation per state. So that was, they decided on two representatives per state. So in the Senate, all states, regardless of their population, have an equal vote, two votes, okay? So that satisfied the smaller states. So they all went, great idea, and they went along with that. Um, uh, another compromise was the Electoral College. Um, that is when you have, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this later on when we discuss the executive branch, but the Electoral College elects the President of the United States, and the bigger states that have more population have more votes towards electing the president. That was one of the compromises. The three-fifths compromise. Um, do we count adult male slaves as uh, people? And the answer was sort of. So you've seen the diagram here. White men counted one uh, for one towards the population of representation and slaves uh, male slaves counted three-fifths of a person. Uh, so they used those and add those numbers together uh, to decide what the population of the slave states were. So they included white, white men and uh, slaves as well. Uh, the slave trade compromise. They decided not to do anything on the slave trade issue until 20 years after the Constitution was ratified because they were worried that the southern states that had slavery and relied on slavery uh, wouldn't go along with the Constitution. Uh, and then that's a lot of compromises, and the answer is why, or I'm sorry, the question is why, and the answer is, is because we already had a, uh, the 13 states were, were diverse in their interests, uh, and to make them come together as a nation, uh, you had to give and take there. So uh, compromises are, are really, really important for this. Now, immediately, the people that kind of like this power being with the state governments, that's how the Articles of Confederation was, more power was with the state governments than with the national government. Um, they didn't like that because they said that um, the Constitution is a threat to 
these values that are listed here, law, political stability, principles of the Articles of, uh, I'm sorry, the Declaration of Independence, that is a big one. Uh, to federalism, which is the relationship between the state and national government, it said it had a nice balance under the Articles of Confederation. The states have more power. Um, and that's how it should be, because the smaller the government is, the less corrupt it'll be and the closer it is to the people. They just, the anti federal saw you have a, now a large national government that's very powerful and it's going to start taking away people's um, rights and, and so forth. And that would, dec that would violate what they believe was the Declaration of Independence. The anti federalists said, we're just going right down the same path that Great Britain went uh, towards and we broke away from them. So now we're heading back to what they have. That doesn't seem right. Okay. Um, now, to counter the anti-federalist arguments, a group of essays were published, and an assignment you have this week is to do a social media campaign pushing the Constitution, push in, pushing in favor of the Constitution. Of course, they didn't have social media in 1787, so what they did was they, they put together um, a series of essays and they published them in newspapers all around the country, especially New York. New York was a key state. They didn't know if New York was going to ratify the Constitution or not. And they figured if New York ratified the Constitution, then other states would go along with them. By the way, ratifying means accepting the Constitution as the law of the land. So um, these are actually were written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, these Federalist Papers, even though they published them under what they call pseudonyms, um, fake names. So in Federalist 10, Madison says that... Uh, it's actually the, the Constitution is a good thing because it prevents against tyranny of the majority. Tyranny is a government that takes away people's rights and doesn't respect it. Think of a dictatorship as, as tyrannical or, or, or tyranny. Okay. Um, they said that the majority, there will never ever be a permanent majority, this is what Madison said, in the Constitution because there are so, we have such a big republic, 13 states, that nobody can get a majority. Um, if a majority is gotten on an issue, you have like two or three small groups band together to make a majority. But once they get their issue passed, then that group is going to break away uh, and there's not going to be a majority anymore. Okay? So, um, he said there's going to be these factions. He called them factions. They're political parties today. And he was right because we have political parties and some are dominant over time. Uh, they're in the majority, but that doesn't last a long time. Um, think of, if you, if you follow politics now, think of the House of Representatives in the last 15 years, how much the House of Representatives have jumped from Republican majority to a Democratic majority and then back to a Republican majority and then back to a Democratic majority. That's what Madison was talking about. We're such a big, diverse republic that there's, there's, there isn't going to be a majority. Or if there is a majority, it's not going to last too long. Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, this already. Hamilton uh, wrote one called Federalist 51. He said, our government, is this new government, is not going to be tyrannical because it has checks and balances. Um, you separate the powers. Uh, you've got branches. You've got the legislative, executive, and judicial branch. That keeps one, and they've got these checks and balances on each other that keeps one branch from becoming dominant over the other. And when you take power and you dilute it amongst three branches, you're not going to have tyranny. You're not going to have a dictatorship uh, like, like they felt Great Britain had. So some of these checks and balances would be things like impeaching the president. What if the president goes beyond the law and breaks the law? Well, uh, you just impeach and remove the president. I know that sounds simple, but it really isn't. Um, how, what if what if the the Congress passes a law that the president doesn't like? The president can veto that law. What if Congress and the president pass a law that takes away people's free speech rights? Well, then the Supreme Court can step in and say that law violates the Constitution. Those are all checks and balances. Okay, and these have worked over time. It's it's we don't have a dominant branch of government. They're they're pretty fairly equal. Okay, um, so already okay. So that that is what I want you to understand the differences between 
the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and the arguments that they made in favor and against the Constitution. And hopefully, the project that you do, the social media project, will help you understand that as well. So once again, if you have questions, uh, let me know. Uh, come into my office hours or send me emails if I don't see you on a daily basis.